this could get messy if it doesn't work. It could. And we're right in the firing line. Yeah, well, you worked it out. You said... <laughs> Three quarters of a tonne of car versus some eggshell. It's so messy. Oh, I can hear some... I can hear... I can hear cracking. <laughs> Is that it? I think it's worked. I Richard. always said it would. I always said it would. There are only chicken eggs holding up a whole car. Now, in actual fact, you worked it out. You reckon that those eggs could hold more than that. I think so, yeah. What I'm getting at is I've got another crushed car. The eggs are supporting three quarters of a ton already, but could the double curved shape let them hold more? Can they take a second car? This is going to be the fun part. <laughs> You'll hear them say things like left a bit, right a bit. Susan. Yeah. Oh, I can hear cracking again. I can hear cracking. <laughs> <laughs> Some rather uh, intriguing cracks I can hear now. These eggs have delivered. I mean, they really have. <laughs> That's two cars. I think we've proved the point. Thanks to their double curve, these eggs are supporting over one and a half tonnes. One final thing, just in case you thought, yeah, hang on, they're all hard-boiled eggs or made out of concrete, I'd just like to prove they are all real, raw eggs. Amy, are you ready? Yep. OK, line up your wire. Uh-huh. Uh, a bit closer, a bit closer, a bit closer. Are you happy? Yep. OK, right, let's go. One, two, three, go! <laughs> yep. <sighs> Definitely real eggs. Stronger than you think, and all thanks to that shape, the double curve. And like dams, eggs and boats, the walls here at the Guggenheim are built with a double curve to give them their strength. But the double curves created a whole new problem. Normally, architects make scale models and then draw two-dimensional plans which the engineers build from. But the Guggenheim's contours are so complicated, it would need thousands of these plans, a nearly impossible task. Gary turned to something that would allow them to build it without all those plans, computer-aided design, or CAD. It's hard to believe now, but until Gary came along, 3D computer-aided design had only been used on cars and planes. Some architects had used rudimentary CAD before, but the Guggenheim was the first time it became an essential part of the entire design and construction process. This was an architectural revolution. Once Gary had designed the building using wooden and cardboard models, he turned to software created for engineering fighter jets. To use the advanced software, first Gary's models needed to be entered into the computer. This meant measuring them precisely. That isn't easy on such abstract shapes. Traditional methods like rulers and calipers were too slow and impractical to map the unusual shapes. Gary needed a way to measure quickly in three dimensions. And the solution to his problem began with the humble trundle wheel. You know, seen these surveyors use them to measure distances. One full revolution of this wheel takes me one meter along the ground. Simple. And they used exactly the same principle to design the world's first tracker ball. So the trundle wheel can measure in one direction or axis. The next stage is measuring in two axes. It's the job of the tracker ball, which is basically an upside down computer mouse. Here's how it works. This is the ball that you move around. And whilst you're moving it, what it's doing is turning these little miniature trundle wheels inside. The engineers call them rotary encoders, probably because it sounds cooler, but that's essentially what they are, trundle wheels turning. As 
As the ball moves, so do the mini trundle wheels. One measures movement in one direction along the x-axis, the other at right angles to it along the y-axis. So both coordinates can be recorded simultaneously. It was invented by a group of engineers just after the Second World War as part of a Canadian project called DATA, a way of sharing radar information between ships. The tracker ball was used to move a cursor across the radar screen to the position of the ship. When the operator pressed a button, the exact coordinates of the ship were recorded instantly. And this might be a more modern version. The rotary encoders are a bit more complicated, but essentially this is exactly the same as the Canadians' first principles, the tracker ball. Datar was too expensive to go into full operation, but its principle went on to inspire the invention of the computer mouse. It was these rotary encoders that made it possible to measure accurately and quickly in 2D. All well and good. But for Guggenheim, Gary needed something that would work on his 3D models. Without it, Gary's futuristic building could never realistically be built. But luckily, in the 1970s, an American engineer called Homer Eaton found a way of easily measuring in three dimensions, all thanks to his passion for pipes. Homer started making exhaust for hot rods as a high school hobby. And, well, this, this isn't a hot rod, obviously, it's a standard car. But you can see, even on a standard car like this, the exhaust is a bit of a 3D puzzle because it's got to make left and right turns and up and down. Homer needed a way to replicate the bends and turns he made for a particular design every time. He needed a device to measure precisely the left and right turns, the ups and downs he put in the pipe. What it needed was a 3D measuring device. So Homer invented one. He used the tracker ball idea and added more rotary encoders so it could measure in all three axes. Homer had invented the snappily titled Articulated Measuring Arm. It was just what Gary's team needed to scan his Guggenheim models. Homer's arm is still used today, and measuring expert Steve Schickel is here to show me how it works. So, am I overstating it to say that this is a kind of modernised version of what Homer Eaton came up with. The principles of this are exactly the same. Every single axis that moves, we have an encoder. And ultimately, what we're doing is calculating the XYZ centre of this probe tip. So where it's jointed in each of these bits where it hinges, that's where there's something measuring exactly where it's That's right. So how do you then use it? It's like pointing your finger, so you take it to the, to the surface, I just put it on the surface, push your button, and I get an XYZ coordinate. So it's as simple as that. Gary's team used Homer's measuring arm to painstakingly enter every individual point needed to scan his models. Even making an accurate computer model of a small shape like this takes at least 2,000 coordinates. Nowadays, laser scanners do the same job much quicker. Uh, Steve, this suddenly looks faintly sinister. What is it? What we have here is a, a scanning cab. Can you demonstrate? Would you like to take a seat? I did, you know, I saw the scene and thought, yeah, go on, all right, I'll okay. take a seat, yes. You're so, going to scan uh, my face with that. Exactly. OK, um, <laughs> begin. It's like visiting a very futuristic dentist. <laughs> As Steve scans the laser over me, it measures the distance to my face. At the same time, the tracker unit, that's the thing that looks like a slightly sinister robot, is measuring the position of the laser using rotary encoders. All the information is processed by a computer to produce exact X, Y, Z coordinates. OK, Richard, you can open your eyes. You're done? I'm done. Right, so where is it now? Where's all that okay. data? Hopefully you can recognise the person that's on the screen. It's, it's disappointing. Is, is this machine very accurate? It certainly is. Oh, God. We're getting down to about 30 microns, which is half the thickness of a strand of hair. So that's all stored now in this computer as data? That's right. If you actually look on the screen, we'll just show this as points. Each one of those is a single X, Y, Z coordinate. Steve took thousands of coordinates in less than a minute. In the same time, Gary's team would struggle to take 60 in making their computer plans. Those plans could then be manipulated by the software, but Gary wanted real models to play with, so the process was reversed at every stage. Gary's team would continually make new models for him using the coordinates on the computer system. They were usually in wood and took a lot of time to make. 
Nowadays, 3D printing allows fast reproductions of just about anything, including my face.